Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Bethlehem Central Board of Education meeting, January 16th. Um, we were in executive session discussing contractual and personnel matters. Um, just to let people know, we are being videotaped. And um, if we have participation in government students, we will take a break at 9 o'clock if we're not done, and you can come up and sign out if you choose to. And we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if we could start with introductions. I guess, Kate, you're on the end there. Michael Cooper. Diane Stever. Matt Downey. Charmaine Widgesinger. Lynn Lenhart. Okay. So tonight, um, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. He's going to go through some of the presentations, um, and then we'll start with that. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, public hearing, and we want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this evening's presentation, uh, there are a lot of people that brought this to be, and I'd like to just recognize our architects uh, that have been helping bring from the very beginning of this project through, and Mr. Ed McGraw from Ashley McGraw, Mr. Dan Hughcraft also from Ashley McGraw, Mr. Pete Osborne is up here for from Appel Osborne Landscaping Architects, uh, Derek Derek um, <laughs> Hetero from Ashley McGraw and Sandra March uh, as well from Ashley. These are individuals that came on sort of as we were starting, but also were taking a lot of information from almost 2009, 2010 and trying to bring it current so that the board could see projections for what any project would look like come roughly the year 2014. So I wanna thank them for trying to turn this around as fast as they could as they come up to speed. In addition, our entire administrative team is uh, throughout the auditorium. I wanna thank them for coming out as well as my executive administrative team here uh, we're here to, if we need to, answer any questions, but tonight is really about the community uh, talking with the board as the board has been going through this process for quite some time as we start with our presentation. Uh, tonight, as we look back, before I even came here, uh, the BCS, or Building Condition Survey, was put into place by New York State back in 2005. Because the district was going through a capital project at that time, they were waived from having to complete that. However, in 2010, they had to complete it for the first time, although it's the second time for uh, school districts across the state. In that, you have to do a five-year capital facility plan, which basically allows architects to go through the entire facility and identify key infrastructure items and their projected useful life or uh, reaching the end of their useful life and providing that information to the board. Although that was done in 2010, we're now in 2011, 2012 looking at it and you're actually one or two years behind when a school district would hopefully be able to take action. <coughs> With the financial situation for New York State at that time, it was very difficult. It's still difficult, but one of the things that is happening is by keeping de the deferment of ongoing maintenance and infrastructure items, costs do build and also potential failures may occur. That's one of the reasons why the state has enacted the building condition survey. In 2012, basically around, um, I would say around May to June, uh, community came forward and discussed with the board uh, some of the possible uh, renovations they would like to see along the lines of the athletic presentation from our own athletic director as well as from the community members. And then basically after our budget vote, uh, the board took some time and we started off the beginning of the year doing as much research uh, as possible to develop some of our process for the community to participate throughout this. One of the things I, I would hope that everybody would agree is that we have tried to be as open and transparent as Board of Education and Administration with the community and solicit as much input as possible. 
Throughout that, a various amount of meetings have happened between September and December <clears throat> to lead us to roughly this point with eight Board of Education meetings and three community forums, of which one of those forums was a, sort of like a public hearing, as is the intent of tonight. Now, basically, we're in 2013, and our discussion on the bond at the January 2nd meeting started to firm up potential scopes. Uh, and that is important because that's truly when you start talking about what projects entail and the actual financial price tag for the community to look at. And then the board also scheduled this public hearing for this evening. So as we've gone through that process, the, pro pro the project itself has started to evolve. And that sort of really happened at January 2nd with the Board of Education making a decision to if they're putting this bond referendum forward with a resolution, they have chosen to split the resolution into two propositions. Proposition one consists of the highest priority items as identified by the architect as well as our district staff. And those are our items over here on the uh, right. And these are also found on our website. And main proposition one, I think, is roughly in total I believe $20,700,000. Uh, they contain various items that deal with our envelope, our site work, any building systems and safety, renovations, technology, as well as any type of overall improvements, now especially to meet what's going to be a new unfunded mandate of online testing going forward. This proposition helps us to hopefully stave off some of that unfunded mandate that is going to be handed down within the next year and we have already been warned uh, about this situation in the lines of technology. So that's really the makeup of Proposition 1. You can find this sheet as well. We, we provided the handouts in the back. Uh, we estimated about 75. Hopefully that's enough. If not, these are also listed on our website <laughs> under the proposed facility uh, link that's on the left-hand side of our website main page. As we go through, the project has also evolved a little bit, and I know that we've received some communications that when we went to this list of 90 items, some items were reduced and cut off. Well, one of the things the board was also researching at the time was what's known as an energy performance contract. And we looked at it as the bond issue, as well as one proposal and a second proposal, but there's also a third amount of work which is called an EPC or energy performance contract that the board has the authority to put into place. And that allowed us to take a certain amount of items out of the main project and we will move forward with them and the resolution will go forward because these projects are not paid forward by the tax base but taken from savings that are maintained over the course of 18 years out of the actual school budget. So it's actually beneficial to try to make savings and do the work and have that uh, as part of a budget reduction and efficiency for the district. And if Bill, could you put up the EPC uh, list? Basically, on the website, you'll have this, and this is a third list. And right now, there's roughly about 12 items. The total is about 3.1 million. But a lot of these are energy efficient items that would most likely and generally qualify under an energy performance contract. These have the highest probability, although there are still others in our main bond that could come out, they have such a long lifespan that they may not qualify. So we need to have those done that we felt we could not take those out and place them in this category because there was too much of a risk. So that is also on our website. So you have your main proposition of 20.7. This 3.1 is being removed, but will go in uh, sort of sync with the project as it develops if it's approved by the community. If the main project is not approved by the community, this project will still be moving forward because this affects our direct budgetary items and energy efficiencies of the school district. In addition, the project evolved into a second proposition, and this is probably more of the controversial proposition or the wants in, the, in any proposition. 
Uh, here, the board has decided to issue a multi-use synthetic turf field option for the community to potentially consider. That would be one of the options in a resolution that would go forward on the 23rd, pending the board's final decision. With that proposition too, they also wanted to make sure that it was dependent that if proposition one does not uh, pass with voter support, even if proposition two does, the board would not go forward with proposition two. The reason is, is aid. Proposition two cannot be funded with the aid ratio without appropriate work in each of the buildings and sites. That work is only in Proposition 1. So in a way, both propositions are linked, but the community has the say on both Proposition 1, the main uh, sort of concept of infrastructure improvements, and Proposition 2, the turf field. Now in that, we've also received some uh, issues in regards to, well, before the turf field, if you looked at the price alone, was $5 million. That's because the $5 million included drainage and everything that would be required to support that type of an infrastructure. In addition, it also has uh, an eight lane track upgrade, light upgrades, as well as bleacher upgrades, uh, full track surface overhaul, as well as the synthetic field and the draining of that field. The reason why it's only at three, I think three million dollars or 3.1 million dollars is because one of the things the community said to the board throughout is there's problems and we need to fix the problems. The football field, as it's been termed, has a drainage issue, a major drainage issue, and has always had that. The lights need to be corrected because they're made of wooden, uh, old wooden poles and those poles have warped to the point that they can no longer be repaired. The, the track surface has to be resurfaced because it's at, I think, at or very near its end of its useful life. So these projects needed to be done. So the board in its debate and discussions talked about we need to do certain things that have to be done because we have an obligation to do those uh, items for infrastructure maintenance and maintaining uh, the good working order of the district. What happened was, out of that five million, $1.8 million identified for the lighting, the resurfacing of the track, the drainage, I believe I got everything there, uh, was separated away from that five million and put into Proposition 1. So if Proposition 1 were successful and passed, the drainage issue would be addressed along with the track surface and the lighting poles. If both propositions were successful, that 1.8 million would be converted back to the turf from 3 million to 5 million to take care of the drainage needs that are associated with a multi-use synthetic field. So either way, the drainage would have to be updated. It also includes additional because additional drainage funds because there is more cost associated with draining uh, a structure as a multi-use synthetic field, as well as taking care of the lights, as well as make converting from a six lane track to an eight lane track. So we want to be clear with the public, no one is trying to sort of move the numbers. It's a question of drainage was the key issue and a main issue, that that was being identified as more on the need side with Proposition 1 where there is an interest for a multi-use uh, synthetic field on the other side, which is Proposition 2. And when I say multi-use, I really need you to understand, it's not a football field. It is a field for every single athletic. It is a gym station throughout the entire day. It is also a community field for all community organizations. So that's some of the information that are out there, and that's how to evolve. The big thing is if the propositions go through, real quick, back one, please note that in Proposition 2 where it says that we would have a resurfacing of the existing track and field irrigation, if both propositions were passed, those would no longer be needed because you don't need to irrigate a multi-use field. So those, those figures 
that money, money, money amount would be pulled away from that project, and that's why it's only five million instead of it would have been like 5.2. Now, how has the money evolved? When we first started, we came out to the community and we showed numbers from 2009 that totaled with the multi-use field around $15 million. With the soft cost that nobody was really calculating, although we put it out there and it's on every document, it would have been around a project around 18.7 the way that we were told soft costs were going to be calculated with our former uh, advisors. With that, that was only at 25%. Most soft costs are calculated about 45%. So what happened is, as we brought on Ashley McGraw, prices were now being verified for not 2009, but 2014, which is roughly the earliest time that construction could begin. That's when the community saw for everything that we identified, roughly a $30 million project. My administrative team, Mr. Nolte, the architects, the Board of Education, all looked at this material and we've started to make some decisions on how we could produce the best fiscal plan so that you have the best representation from us trying to do the right thing for the district to move forward. That brings us to the third line, which is ultimately where Right now, the project stands in two propositions of a total of about $23.9 million. And that's not divided, but on, online in this presentation will also be online tomorrow. Uh, it's divided by the categories and it's also co color coded, with about 39% being attributed to soft costs. The green area is the synthetic turf in each of the areas. The orange is the technology infrastructure and the blue is the facility infrastructure. So that is the breakdown. So now that I've given you sort of a brief history and recap, I'm going to turn it over to Director of Facilities and Operations, Mr. Greg Nolte, as he goes through some of the breakdowns of each of the projects. Which one do you want me to use? This? I'll apologize uh, in advance. I'm, I'm one of many um, suffering with the, uh, the flu and my voice is going in and out, so we'll see how I do. Um, okay, um, go to the first part. Um, we have 90 plus items um, that, that we've uh, identified as part of this, this referendum um, um, that most of you have right now. I can't believe that it's been 11, 12 meetings and, and four months of, of work um, um, over this, uh, it, it's, gone, it's gone very much like, like, like a flurry. Um, but uh, we, we took these 90 plus items and basically um, uh, separated them into about six basic categories. Um, we have um, building envelope, which is your shell, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, site work, uh, building systems, safety and emergency management, uh, building renovation, um, the multi-use synthetic field and technology aspects. Um, as Dr. Douglas mentioned, um, we are proposing two uh, propositions. The main proposition being about 20.7 million. Uh, the, the second proposition being the, synth the synthetic turf being 3.1. Um, um, makes up the, the second portion. So uh, building envelope, um, we'll talk about each one right now. This is the, the largest portion of the bond. It's about 32%, about 7.7 .7 million, and uh, basically includes items such as uh, roofing, masonry, uh, window replacement, and uh, um, associated structural reinforcing um, that will have to do to, um, so we uh, meet current snow uh, load regulations uh, with our roof. But in, to in total of the 90 items, we have about 19 of those make up the, uh, the building envelope. Um, site work um, takes up about 19% of, uh, of the pie. Um, it's about 4.5 million. Um, this includes uh, a number of items, um, um, sidewalk replacement, uh, paving reconstruction at, at a, a number of locations, uh, drainage improvements at a few elementary schools in, in the fields, 
Um, drainage improvements, as Dr. Douglas previous talked about, um, at, at the high school playing fields, um, a new um, lighting system uh, for the Van Dyke field, um, uh, repair and resurfacing of the high school and the middle school tennis courts is also included in this number. Um, and um, old playground replacements at Ellesmere, Glenmont, and, and Hammergrill. Um, and there are about 17 items that uh, make up this uh, portion of the work. Uh, building systems, safety, and emergency management, uh, about 14% of, of the project, about 3.4 million. Um, there are various HVAC uh, projects. HVAC stands for heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Um, you have plumbing and electrical upgrades, um, elevator and emergency lighting upgrades at, at uh, I believe, the high school and in the middle school. Um, replacement of some of our older kitchen equipment um, is in that number as well. Um, we have master clock systems at the high school and the middle school that are antiquated that need to be replaced. Um, there is also installation of a limited emergency power generation at the high school, the middle school, um, and transportation. Um, also included is the installation of interior and exterior security cameras at the high school, middle school, and exterior cameras at transportation and the operations and, and maintenance uh, facility. Um, there are also other security measures that are included uh, in this. Um, a total of about 28 different light items um, encompass this. Uh, building renovations, 14% um, of, the, of the pie. Uh, a lot of this is, um, a good portion of this is asbestos abatement at many of the schools. It's primarily floor tile uh, at most of the schools. Uh, in the last bond, we got rid of a lot of our thermal insulation um, with our mechanical systems. Uh, a lot of gym floor refinishing, uh, and then miscellaneous building and bathroom uh, renovation work. A technology, um, although it's the smallest portion, it's by no means the, the least important. I'm sure Sal will agree. Um, it's about 8% of, of our pie here. Uh, there's various uh, voice over IP upgrades, uh, network uh, switch upgrades, uh, a wireless system at the middle school, and various LCD projectors. Uh, there's additional tech improvements, as uh, Dr. Douglas mentioned earlier. Uh, that are included um, so we can uh, comply with some mandates that I believe have to be implemented by 2014. Yeah. And we've talked about the field. Um, this is about 13% of uh, the, this total bond. Uh, this includes, and again, this is a separate proposition, uh, it includes um, a new 225 foot wide uh, synthetic turf uh, multi use field uh, and a new eight lane track and then uh, various uh, changes to the bleachers, the scoreboard, the press boxes, and, and sidewalks that would have to happen. And that's it. Good evening, everybody. At our last meeting, we referred to a number of different possible combinations of the propositions, and we looked at what the various cost impacts would be and that was a tool that the board had used when they made the ultimate recommendation as to what these propositions should look like. To your right is a summary of what the tax impacts would look like for you um, per $100,000 of assessment. For Proposition 1, which includes all the items that Greg Nolte referred to for the $20.7 million, it would be about $17.49 per 100,000 of assessment. Proposition two, if that passed at the $3.1 million, would be $2.68 per 100,000 of assessment. If both propositions were to pass in those amounts for the total of the $23.9 million, you would be looking at about $20.17. This is the net cost to the taxpayers. This is after factoring in the estimated amounts of state aid that would come to the district based on the composition of the projects that are included on the detailed list. Um, we will be putting a tax impact calculator up on the web page very shortly, so you can actually go in there and take what your assessed value is on your property 
and by inputting that, it will calculate what the impacts would be based on your own unique assessed value. Again, just another tool to help you determine if this is something that you feel is viable for your households as we have prepared this. I guess I get the prize for quickest update tonight. I turn it back <laughs> to Dr. Douglas. That doesn't happen every day. Um, and, and unfortunately, I've always had to give Judy some homework. Um, I was just talking to Ms. Monroe, the assistant superintendent, and I don't even think the architects know this, but NISPA just put out a release that uh, we have not factored in, uh, but it's a positive release on safety and security items after July 1st. Uh, the state is now going to give an additional 10% aid that is not factored into any of our costs. So we will have to update that, and they just released a, a flyer on that for now. So in those situations, our aid for just those types of items would go from 70% potentially up to 80.1. Uh, so the board needed to know that rather quickly. Uh, tonight now is really about public comment. I'm going to. Uh, because we have the statement right behind you now, Ms. Stevers. Uh, I know you were going to read it, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, we're here as, as well at the board's disposal to answer any questions for the community as you guys all deem fit at this point. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, all right, so we'll start the public comments. I guess I'll just quickly read this, um, that the speakers state their names in relationship to the district, whether they're a parent, staff member, um, speakers take no longer than one to two minutes to ask a question of the board, submit information, or give an opinion to the board. Actually, the board's not going to be talking, so the questions would be directed over to Dr. Douglas or Ms. Kehoe. Um, and then Bill DeVoe is going to be the one doing the timing. Um, that those in attendance provide the courtesy of allowing a member of all the public, a member of the public, the opportunity to state to the, I think I just read that, right? All right, that all members of the public in attendance shall be given the opportunity to address the board before any individual is allowed to do so a second time. And the board will not be answering questions this evening so that we can hear from everyone in attendance in a timely manner. However, if a speaker's comments need clarification, one of our district officials will offer remarks. This way we can hear from as many people as possible and make sure that the information and comments presented are accurately represented in the records for questions and answers. Um, so with all that said, a little lengthy, um, I guess we'll start. Can I start? <laughs> you may. <laughs> Jim Kelly, I live on Louise Street, and uh, I had the good fortune to be involved in the process 10 years ago with regard to whether or not to have a turf field. And I think the arithmetic comes out that had the board back then done a turf field instead of putting in two new grass fields, the money they would have saved over 10 years on maintenance costs far outweigh the minor difference in costs that existed back then. So I encourage the board to go forward with the turf field proposal. I'd also say that support of athletics brings with it ancillary benefits. Anybody involved in the legal community like I am frequently sees the product of kids without something to do. And when kids are involved in athletics, they take a positive attitude. They have positive reinforcement. And the role models of the coaches at this high school and in many other districts gives kids that thing to go for, the goal that makes them good citizens. I'd also like to say that I'm an empty nester. I had four children go through here, and they got a number of varsity letters, and they also had the opportunity to be in theater. And no one extracurricular activity is no less important than any others, and that's why I think it's important for the board to move forward, get a turf field, and let all the kids in the community benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go now. Go ahead. <laughs> and my name is Monica Sharp. I have, I'm a parent of a child here. And I'm very concerned with the health and safety of the children with the synthetic turf. I have a fact sheet from the New Jersey Work Environment Council, which states that it's made of toxic metals, carcinogens, latex, and other rubbers and phthalates. And Micro, microbes will grow up. I would like to hand to each one of the board members those sheets. I believe some of you have children here, and this turf will expose our children to health issues and is also going to do harm to our environment. I, excuse me, I'm going to. Thank you. 
Go ahead. Thanks for the chance to speak. Dr. Ewan McNay, I have two kids in BCST. I run a neuroscience research lab at UAlbany. Um, for context, I played myself rugby through college level. I've coached um, game bridge teams to national and international levels. I currently hold four world, four world titles in different games. So I'm a fan of sports, I'm a fan of competition. What I would like to point out, though, are the risks that a synthetic field brings, particularly in my field of neuroscience brain injury. Um, <coughs> data I'm happy to share with the board. The increased risk of a synthetic field versus a turf field is pretty clearly established. That comes in a couple of different areas. Um, the be best studied injury are ACL tears. I did some quick back of the envelope math. The risk of an ACL tear goes up by about 40% on a synthetic field versus a turf field. <coughs> For the high school, if my figures are correct, it's about one to two extra ACL injuries alone per year. More worrying for me is the fact that on all artificial turf fields that have been studied, the risk of concussion goes up. And there are fairly convincing recent data on the link between early concussion and later, later life, dementia, um, Alzheimer's <coughs> disease is a big one, amyloid accumulation, toxic effects throughout the lifespan. So it looks to me as though we're thinking of spending $3 million to increase quite dramatically the risk to our children. That seems like a really crazy thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm a parent of two students in the district. I first wanted to start by commending and thanking the board for your openness and transparency throughout this entire process. Um, Dr. Tom, uh, Dr. Thomas and um, the superintendent and Mrs. Kehoe have been very, very quick to uh, return emails to me, and I thank them very much for your transparency. Um, we are asking for $3 million at a time since 2010 when we have lost 120 positions in the school district, 62 of which were teachers. The budget that we're currently working under represents $3 million of cuts to teachers and programs. Even with the state aid of 70% or perhaps 81 or 80%, uh, we'll still be paying around $900,000 for the field. I understand there's some discussion about a an, uh, synthetic turf field costing less in the long run with maintenance. One thing that hasn't been discussed a whole lot, I think Mr. Osborne mentioned it earlier at a previous meeting, and I'm not convinced that we would not have to pay for the disposal in about 10 years for the carpet of the synthetic turf field. The research I've done uh, reveals about $130,000 simply for the disposal, another $500,000 for a replacement carpet. None of that is state aidable to my knowledge. So yes, while we could have had a synthetic turf field earlier, in about 10 years, I do believe this district will be asking the taxpayers for $500,000 more of unaidable money, potentially $630,000 of unaidable money with the disposal. I think that's really worth considering about kicking the can down the road a little bit more. And I think maybe Mrs. Kehoe could do some math for us. Where does it end up? If, if my figures are accurate, if the uh, upkeep of a natural turf field uh, numbers are accurate, in 10 years, where does that leave us? And it would be even sooner if the, t if the field is used more frequently. The more you use it, the shorter the lifespan of a turf field. Thank you very much for the transparency and for the time to speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jill Doyle, and I'm the mother of three boys in the fourth, sixth, and eighth grade. Currently, they're participating in travel basketball, rec basketball, travel soccer, and swimming. I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Douglas and Greg Nolte on Monday regarding the facilities bond and both the pools at the middle school and high school. I am hopefully optimistic that the EPC will be able to fund the necessary mechanical updates to both pools. I would ask the Board of Ed to be vigilant in following, exactly, in following exactly what is recommended to be included in the EPC following the energy audit. The mechanical issues related to both pools were listed as priority ones. If the underlying mechanical structures of both pools are not maintained, there will be no swim program. High school sports are a wonderful opportunity for students to participate in. Some sports are valued by the general population as being more important than others. This district has had a wonderful tradition of having a very strong swim program. If you were in this school in the 70s, the pool that you were, would have been swimming in would have looked exactly the way it does now. While I understand that these are difficult financial times for the district, I was disappointed to see the removal of upgrading the pool interior finishes at the pools. While timing yesterday at the high school meet, I noticed that only one of three lights above the six starting blocks actually worked. Although the interior finishes seemed on surface to be just cosmetic updates, is this the message we want to give these hardworking swimmers, that this district can't even provide the proper lighting for them to compete? 
please do not forget about the pool when the facilities are being updated. Thank you. My name is Connor Doyle. I'm an eighth grade student at BCMS. Uh, this is in, I'm in my sixth year swimming, and I'm also a hardworking student musician. This year, I have earned the wonderful opportunity to swim for my high school varsity team. It is in my interest to uh, swim on this team for another four years. Along with that, I would love to be captain one day. I would be strongly affected if the pool were not to be maintained in the way it should be, seeing as I have so much time left to swim. I may not have that opportunity if no money is put in for the pool to help maintain it. Swimming has given me the self-confidence required to perform well in academics and everything else I do. I want this pool to be maintained because over the years I have been able to interact with a variety of age groups and it would like people of all ages to have the opportunity to be able to try swimming as a competitive sport. I also want for my younger brothers and their peers to have the same great experiences I am having as part of the high school team. Having a turf football field may be very important to useful our team, but having an updated pool is equally important. It is hard being part of a sport that takes place in an area your peers think is gross and disgusting because it is not updated. When my friends at the middle school have the swim unit, they dread the moment when they have to go in the pool each day because the pools are so outdated. Please consider keeping the pool updated as part of the bond. Thank you. Hi, my name is Judy Abbott, and I have, a, I have children in Bethlehem Central School District. Um, first, I just want to mention, I, I know you have these roles for the people that participate here. I don't know what your online participation is tonight, but it seems to me that those rules ought to be equitable and applied to those people as well that can just participate with nameless and faceless uh, manner. We're not um, doing online tonight, right? In the future, I, please consider Abby, that. Could you just speak directly into the microphone? Thank you. Last time I did it, blasted me with terrible sound. Um, well, only it seems really hard for me to believe that only a couple of years ago I was here begging you to uh, find the courage to increase your tax levy to 2.2 percent to save my elementary school, um, and now that you have found uh, um, the ability to raise tax levies to 3.3 percent last year, 3.99 uh, percent. Um, and now you're talking about almost a 2400 or $24 million bond. I just I keep scratching my head like, geez, didn't we just can't, you know, lose my elementary school after over 300 people were begging you guys to find another way to keep our community school open? Um, and I think that sentiment still exists in our community. We still would like our school. But not, nonetheless, I'm here to really talk about um, um, this uh, bond issue tonight. I feel like there, you know, although I, yes, there has been quite a bit of transparency, I still have not seen the results of your survey monkey tool um, that you, you know, uh, promoted not that long ago to see, seek what the opinion was of the community on this matter. On this matter, um, that, um, I think that should be made available. I also am confused by the, um, um, I forgot the gentleman's name that talked about the cost benefit analysis. <laughs> Um, that was conducted for the synthetic turf field um, into 2003 bond. It was my understanding that the decision was it was not worth the cost and it was de decided to make a really nice natural turf field. And at the cost of this synthetic turf field, I think you could probably put a couple nice natural turf fields in. Um, uh, Ms. Giacconi, I still feel very strongly that you should recuse yourself because your brother is one of the biggest proponents for this. And I know that a couple years ago, a few years ago, your husband was also promoting this idea of a synthetic turf field um, and I would like to make sure that you, if there's even the perception of a conflict of interest I think it should be um, you should recuse yourself um, and I do think that the timing of this budget vote should be at, in at, along with the budget uh, vote the routine the regular budget vote um, because I don't think it should be separated I don't think that people know about it unless you're on SNN no one knows about these meetings um, yes, I know. <laughs> well, you know, the other final thing is I agree, I'm a big athlete myself, and I think it's important to have athletics in, in the schools, even though they only affect a small percentage of participants. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you guys have cut PE, you've cut specials from your budget. You know, if you want to increase, you know, reduce obes obesity, increase the sportsmanship and community well being of your students in the school district, then you know, make PE available for these kids instead of just for the small kids, that w uh, percentage kids that want to participate in school. I think you ought to limit your bond to no more than $15 million as well. Thank, Thank you. you.
go here. Good evening. My name is Bruce Ginsburg. I am president of the Swimming and Diving Booster Club. And uh, the, the reason we're, that we're here, there's so many swimmers here this evening, is, is first of all, I want to thank the school board, Dr. Douglas, Mr. Nolte, and other members of the administration for this long and arduous process that you're going through. But the reason we're here this evening is as we've watched this series of proposed improvements evolve, um, and up until this most recent renovation, uh, rendition, um, we are watching, obviously, everybody has their own self-interest, which facility is being done. And we felt good about the fact that there was $368,000 for dehumidification, air, air purification, and uh, aesthetics, lighting, uh, ceiling, and changes and improvements to it. And we became alarmed when the last, rent, the last change came out, and suddenly all of that had been removed, much of which Ms. Doyle had pointed out, were identified as priority one items. Subsequent to that, um, we did meet with uh, Dr. Douglas, Mr. Nolte, and they did explain to us the, the, these were moved to this energy performance contract in the EPC program and, and actually feel very optimistic and favorable for it. One of the things that we real, I realize is not in there, and I'm going to request that they take a harder look at adding it back in, is there's nothing in there for the lighting or the ceiling improvements of the pools, of, of the high school pool, and as well as for the middle, the middle school. And at one point, I think there was, uh, I want to say probably 60,000 for aesthetics, and I don't know what the number was, uh, was for the lighting. But I'd like to ask to have one that put back in. Two, the other question is an administrative and a procedural one. Tonight, we're talking about Proposition 1 and Proposition 2. But it's my understanding that the EPC has zero impact on, on the taxes to the community, one. Two, does not require public vote. And the only reason it will go to public vote is for an additional 10% in funding. So it, the school board actually has a latitude to approve the EPC so that Mr. Nolte and the contractors that he's been working with can start, start the process now of evaluating and going forward. So I'm appealing that, that the school board takes action now rather than put this off until after Proposition 1 and 2. But let's go forward on the EPC. I see the red zero, zero. I feel like I'm at the Grammys <laughs> and the music's coming back up. Um, so uh, that's what I'm appealing for, is that ta please take action on the EPC mm -hmm. as a part of this now, rather than wait and put it off. Because these are items that have been identified as priority one. There are, there's, uh, there's dollars, there's energy efficiencies, everything that we're, we're trying for. So I appreciate and thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. My name is Jack Porter. I'm referring to item 15 and item 35 where it says, replace or a trace electric panels when i attended the first meeting it was ten thousand dollars and five thousand and fifteen thousand dollars now the total is one hundred and three thousand one hundred and thirty eight dollars i was an electrical superintendent when we did the Gabriel park school systems we did five schools out there we didn't walk off the job at the end until all the panels in the building were were traced all the circuits were labeled i don't understand what happened to the maintenance department here how come they didn't it wasn't on the punch list. They, they just let the contractor walk out without doing it. And also on the website, it says that some of the maintenance department is electrically trained. It's not that hard to trace a circuit on an electrical panel. It seems to me like the public is being asked to pay for something that should have been done in-house. Thank you. Hi. My name is Maddie Ferreira. I am eight years old and in third grade at Hammergrill. I live in Del Mar. My sister Katie is six years old and we swim on the Del Mar Dolphins team. We love it and so do my friends. We practice at the high school. I hope there is a swim team when, I, when we go to school. Swimming is a great sport and it's great for exercise. Lots of my family have been on swim teams. Please give swimming the same support you give other sports and do what you need to do to keep the pool safe and in good shape so that we can have a team when my sister and I get here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy McCarthy. I'm the parent of two BC graduates. Um, the synthetic turf seems like an extravagant and unnecessary expenditure, especially in a time when we have to watch every dollar and consider what is of the best benefit to the district. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ed Taft, um, I'm the parent of three Bethlehem graduates. 
and I use the track between April and uh, October. I'm wondering if we could have the benefits of the artificial turf if we restricted the field width to the current 200 feet rather than expanding it to 225 feet. The other uh, place we could uh, perhaps consider is maintaining the current six lane track. You already have eight lanes for sprints. If expanding the whole track to eight lanes, you're only affecting three events of all of a, of, of a track meet. And finally, in terms of the artificial turf, I think the spotlight was indicating that the maintenance would include rolling and raking. And I'm not sure exactly what kind of artificial surface that would be. I think maybe we'll look into that a little bit more extensively. And secondly, the current, exist the current track is not beat up as uh, Rob Jonas would have us believe. Um, I just also wonder what does the resurfacing of the track actually mean? Is this like painting the orange and restriping the, tr uh, the track? Or is it adding you know, some substance to the, uh, to the actual surface itself? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nolte, do you, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, the, the resurfacing is, is, is like a, a painting over the top. Uh, you have about an inch and a half of that, that rubbered surface. And, and before you get too much UV, you want to protect it with this, this coating. OK. Um, hi, my name is David Cooper. <clears throat> I'm here on behalf of the uh, Glenmont um, Playground Committee. Um, we'd like to thank you for including the playground funding in the current proposal. Like a good toy that has seen its day, our current playground is worn from use, dated and broken. Although attempts have been made, it is beyond repair. With our elementary age children using the playground daily, and with obesity rates on the rise, it is vital that a new and safe playground be built for our children and for those to come. Kids who have access to play perform better in school and gain skill and confidence, team building and creativity. <clears throat> in today's ever increasing testing environment, it is necessary for kids to be able to let off steam and be active. Our PTA has launched a uh, campaign to fund playgrounds, knowing the high cost costs associated with it, and it has already funded over $10,000 in a month's time. Our families know that a new playground is needed and wanted. Please keep the funding included as it is in the playground proposal. Our kids at Bethlehem deserve a fun and safe place to play. Thank you. Thank you. Guess we'll go here. Uh, my name is Tanya Choppy. Um, I'm a parent of two students. I am also a volunteer within the community, especially at the school. Uh, my kids play sports. I'm all for sports. I think sports is a great thing. But I think what we need to do is we need to get out of the buy now and worry about paying for it later mentality. This is what got us into this problem. Um, I've heard people complain that high schoolers had to have their gym class inside because the fields were too wet. Well, last year, a year ago at this time, we talked about cutting gym class for PE from one from every week to every other week. So I'm sorry, but I don't have much sympathy for high schoolers that have to have it inside when elementary school kids almost had it reduced. Um, last year, we cut the Jumpstart program at less than $9,000 a year. Now we want to borrow money for an athletic artificial turf. Is re reading not as important as football? I, I just don't understand where we're going with this. Any additional money it, that I would have to spend in my taxes, I want it to go to put more teachers back in the school, to bring back the teachers that we have had to let go. I think that fixing our field, making it safe is fine. I don't think we need to go the extra mile and borrow more money for athletic turf. Thank you. My name is Walter Gould. I have graduated eight children from this school, and I'm very grateful for the education that they received. I want to know why we, why we are addressing all of these maintenance items when they should be covered in the original budgets. I think putting a $20 million additional cost on our budgets is extraordinarily arrogant, 
And I also want to know uh, why this school board re disregards the needs of some of the senior citizens here in the sense of while we were trying to keep a cap of 3% costs, they just raised the budget amount up to 7%. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> My voice is starting to go a little bit. But I think it's time to look at some of the things we need to do. And I also would like to know very seriously why we can't put adequate drainage on the field. It seems to me that would be a much less cost than replacing it with a turf field. And why wasn't that item addressed when the original field was put in? Drainage is something that's obvious. Maintenance is something that's obvious. We know you're going to need to do some of it. There should be costs allocated in each of the budgets so people are aware of what's going on around here. I think it's time to take a good hard look at where we're spending our money. And I think, very truthfully, that the teachers ought to come back myself because that's what the priority is. We're here to educate the children. We're not here to give them a free pass for scholarships for athletics. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eileen Fitzpatrick. I, I'm a parent of uh, four children uh, in the district, and I want to address the, the board. I want to thank you for the work that you've done up to this point. I know it's been a tremendous amount of work. I want to um, address three perspectives, uh, the, that of a parent, that of um, a, a member of the soccer community, as well as that of a taxpayer. So uh, as, a, as a parent, I'm a big proponent of the replacing the playgrounds and uh, also utilizing the turf field for phys ed. I think that's an incredibly important use for those facilities. As a member of the soccer community, I just want to say that the soccer program is very successful at Bethlehem. Both varsity coaches have said that the, the best scenario for um, the program would be to have the turf field. It alleviates the stress on the actual grass field that's, that's utilized by those, by those teams. Um, additionally, the, um, as far as the soccer community, the, the Bethlehem Soccer Club rents fields outside the district for $60,000 per year that they would be happy to spend at the high school renting the field here, as my understanding is from Pop Warner and other lacrosse programs that would be interested in renting the turf field. They would much rather do it here than elsewhere. So that could be a substantial income for the school district. Um, in addition, the, um, I want to speak a little bit to, um, to the, my role as a taxpayer. I think simply uh, redoing the drainage on the, on the, um, the field is a, a bit of a waste of money. The architect reported that the field, the soil is poor on all the fields on, at the high school. And despite the, the efforts for maintaining those fields by the school district, I'm not sure that it would be any better even after putting $1.9 million in it. I think that the architects also reported that per use the turf field is cheaper and there's lower maintenance costs over time. So I am supportive of the turf field option. And I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name, my name is Terry Rooney. Um, I'm a parent of two uh, youth, uh, two children who are now in, one's at university and one is, uh, has graduated. Um, a couple of things occur to me. First of all, I'm a runner. Um, I won first place in the Del Mar Dash in my age group last spring. I love the track. I think it's a great track. I don't, and it's a fairly new track, the track at the high school. And I was kind of puzzled by the, um, I don't know, how, how, how old is the track? It's someone? 10 years, yeah. I think it's in great shape, but uh, I guess if it needs resurfacing, it needs resurfacing. I'll leave that to the experts. I'm also retired from the New York State uh, Department of Transportation where I did uh, construction management and uh, uh, contract management. And I'm, I, I, my second question would be, how do you arrive at a certain figure? Say you, uh, you've allocated $60,000 for uh, chimney repairs. Is that a cost plus or is it going to be competitively bid or is it a best guess at this time? And you work out the details later with the interests of the uh, community uh, 
uh, at heart. And I guess the third thing is, um, I just, I really, AstroTurf, um, well, actually one, um, one aside there would be, I've worked with a lot of civil engineers and I think they're quite competent to address drainage issues, uh, to address soil issues, to, if necessary, to uh, reconstitute the soil underneath. It's not a huge amount of, um, of, uh, of, of um, acreage there. And I think uh, a, good, a good analysis by a good civil engineer could probably um, correct drainage problems um, pretty effectively and for much less than uh, the 1.8 million that I hear talked about. And I, I, I definitely don't think we're, we need AstroTurf, it's just my gut reaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Bob Myron. I'm a parent of uh, three children, one of which has graduated. I wanted to start with just a question first, is if uh, Proposition 1 is voted down, <laughs> it seems as though these, these uh, improvements are uh, mandated to some extent, right? So what, what's going to happen if, if it's voted down? One of, the, one of the concerns, just say the technology alone. Technology is, I think, 1.3 1. 1. million. <clears throat> if Proposition 1 was voted down, and we know the state is going to go through with online testing, because that's the major reform initiative, by 2014, we'll have to take that 1.3 million and place it in the budget or reduce the budget to be able to pay for that. We already know that that 1.3 million would be above our tax levy limit. So we would either have to challenge just for that piece, not to mention any other cost increase. So just like any other item, if a roof fails, we've got to take it out of the budget. If we take it out of the budget, we must balance our budget by New York state law. And that means if I have to spend 500 or 800,000 or even like in the high school situation, say a million to, million eight for a roof, that would be a substantial hit for the budget and the only way that we'd be able to address those type of numbers would be major staffing reductions. This provides a different formula for the district to avail itself of state support and not rely as heavily on local taxpayers. All right. Um, and, uh, the other uh, perspective I'm speaking from I'm the president of the uh, Girls Lacrosse Booster Club here for the, um, all the schools, the Modified Team, JV, and Varsity. Uh, um, so I, in looking at the field issue, one of the things, uh, the turf field is really, um, you know, for the football field, uh, and I realize it's a multi-use, one of the things that I think some people are not taking a look at is soccer teams and lacrosse teams are practicing on the fields uh, next to the school. So they're, they're practicing on grass fields that uh, certainly in the spring when, the, when it's wet and sloppy and muddy, they're dangerous fields. And um, I talked to Coach Dave Rounds to see what his perspective was on this. And he mentioned to me that currently, uh, because of the conditions of the fields, he, he t one third of his practices are done inside in the gym. Um, because they just cannot get out on the field and use them. Um, so from a strictly lacrosse kind of soccer perspective, uh, I've got uh, a daughter that plays both lacrosse and soccer, a, a son that's graduated who played lacrosse. Uh, I would welcome the opportunity for them to be able to have a multi-use field for their sports. I also see, see a great benefit for the community to be able to use the, these fields for multiple sports as well. I think we only have an opportunity to make this kind of investment for the community. It doesn't come along that often. And I think this is the right time for us to, to uh, invest in our, our kids and our athletes and provide this resource to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Ferrer. I'm a parent of two students. You just heard from one of them uh, earlier. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, when my wife and I chose to uh, move to this area, we based the decision in large part based on the school system and what the school system had to offer. Um, not going to be candid uh, or not be uh, unclear about it. We come from a family of swimmers. <laughs> we all swam competitively. I can speak to the experience of being on a team. 
um, how it can enrich one's lives. Uh, I've actually swam in this pool, albeit for a different high school, uh, a number of years ago. <laughs> um, don't hold that against my comment. Um, I can also speak to the importance of the pool as a community resource. It's a wonderful asset. Um, it would be extremely disappointed to think that uh, a swimming program like the one that's uh, developed here at BCHS, um, which has a, such a storied and rich history, um, would not be available to my children, other children, other kids on the team if the required maintenance is either delayed or never takes place. Um, we're not asking for special treatment, we only to be treated um, equitably. And finally, we're not asking for a new pool, just maintain the one you have. It's a great one, let's keep it going. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tim Nietzsche. My wife, uh, Marjorie, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my lovely wife, Marjorie. <laughs> <laughs> and I are the parents of two student athletes. Uh, I'm also the president of the Bethlehem Central Athletic Association. Some people may be saying to themselves, why is the district asking for authorization to borrow $23.9 million? The short answer is because it was advised by professionals in the most participatory and transparent process I've seen in 20 years of working in and with state and local governments that it needs to spend money on roofs, windows, technology, security, and fields. I think there's more to it than that, though. Mr. Landry, our high school principal, opened the transition meeting last night in this very room with a provocative statement. He said Bethlehem schools are the best. While he did not cite the evidence to support that claim, I'm sure he had it. Sounds like he believes we have great schools here in Bethlehem. Whether they're the best or not, I think the rest of our school leaders share Mr. Landry's assessment. And they've used great care to craft this plan because they believe that without these improvements, we cannot continue to have great schools. And if we don't have great schools, can we have a great community? I know when we decided to move here in 1999, we had many options. We chose Bethlehem for a host of reasons. The top of the list were great schools. It's not easy to be great at anything. Malcolm Gladwell tells us that it, individuals seeking to be great at something will need to practice 10,000 hours to be great. In addition to that commitment, greatness also has to defeat its enemy. Yes, great has an enemy. Jim Collins identified this foe. He says that good is the enemy of great. Now, I don't know what really motivates the opponents of the plan. Maybe they believe we can, be, we can continue to have great schools with only good facilities. If so, I think they should offer evidence to support this belief. Or maybe they believe that good is good enough for Bethlehem. But now imagine your child tells you that they want to take on a project or learn a new skill. Would you encourage them to be good at it? I bet the vast majority of us would, would encourage them to try to be great. Is there a cost to greatness? Yes. Will that be a hardship for some? Undoubtedly. Should we think creatively about how to do something about that? We can and we should. In the interest of time, I'll forego my Theodore Roosevelt quote and just say, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. And thanks to our school leaders, elected and appointed, for giving us, for giving us an opportunity to remain great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Joanne Hicks, parent of three uh, children in the district, two in, Beth, in uh, middle school and one in elementary. I have a problem with each of the propositions, and they're not really problems. They're things that I think you need to think about. First being Proposition 1, the $20 million bond, is there are things on that bond that were on the $93 million bond that didn't get fixed. So if we go over budget on this $20 million bond, who is going to decide what doesn't get fixed this time? That is a concern of mine, because everything that's on here, not everything, some of the things that were on here were put off before, and I hope they don't get put off again. So I just need you to think about that. On the turf field proposition, my problem is 
we are putting that out for a 20 year bond. And any time that I've been to board meetings, which have been many, everyone speaks about you only bond for what you are going to have use for. And everyone has said that this, this turf field is going to be a 10 year, maybe 15 year turf field depending on usage. And we are looking at a tremendous amount of usage for all the teams that say they're going to have an ability to play on this turf field. So are we now looking at this turf field going down in usage amount and we're going to be bonding it for 20 years? That is a concern of mine that I think you need to think about because you are going to be still paying on the bond for this turf field when we need to replace this turf field in 10 years. And if it is, as that gentleman stated, the cost to replace a turf field is over that amount of money, then we are throwing in way more money and still paying for something we just threw out. Thank you. Thank you. Rosie and Gary, I'm a resident and a parent, and I just want to say I think it's very interesting that we're meeting here in the auditorium because this is where just a few weeks ago the Shakespeare group from high school put on Twelfth Night, and in a few weeks they're going to be putting on Into the Woods. So I'm speaking for Proposition 1 because of the point that was made that this is monies that will have to come out of the budget if they don't get addressed here. And when we take monies out of the budget, we've already cut all the things that we've been saying are really good for the students to have. Teachers, athletics, Shakespeare. So if I can take a phrase from another movement a long time ago, bread and roses too. We, we need both. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Bliss. I am a parent of three students in this district. Uh, all three of my kids are runners. I can't begin to describe the benefits they've had um, from their participation for the past oh, seven, eight years uh, in various running programs in the town. I am currently involved with the Del Mar Track and Field Club. We're a great consumer of this track, this is our home field, this is our training facility, and three nights a week from April through early July, I'm out there from six until eight or nine with the kids, uh, they're practicing, and I get to see how well used that facility is. The track is in desperate need of repair. There are chunks on uh, the one lane that's, that are just coming up and very soon we will be unable to host track, um, track and field meets there because the, uh, whoever the section poobahs are will have ruled it unsafe. Um, it's not just runners, it's families out there in the evening. This facility is open. People come here, they walk, they run. You see senior citizens out there rehabbing injuries. Um, Families out there with little kids, just getting them moving. It's a beautiful thing. It's one of the best used facilities in this town. Uh, anybody can come here and run the track. Um, I hope that if we put in a, a turf, if we put in the carpet, everybody will still have the access. Um, that's important to me that it won't be a, we have to protect the rug thing, you know, lock it up at five o'clock because, you know, nobody's going to be able to uh, be out there. Uh, I support some degree, at least, of uh, improvement on the, the track. Uh, the eight-lane track would allow us to host things that the kids really deserve. They've been working really hard, and it's a really good program here at the high school. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's John Sika. I'm a, uh, a graduate of Bethlehem Central, and, and like others who have spoken, I've come back to the area and, and came back to the Bethlehem School District uh, for a lot of great reasons. I've uh, put two kids through school, and I have one more here at, at the high school. And 
Uh, I think it's great, uh, the process that the board has undertaken. Um, there's obviously a lot of creative uh, uh, challenges that we have to uh, face, but uh, after looking at the gym for so long and seeing the lighting and the bleachers and, and talking to people at other schools who said, well, you know, you can get that 100% reimbursed if you, if you go down this path, and, and the board has uh, uh, forged ahead with that path, and that's great. And in going out to um, athletic events and seeing turf fields and small rural communities, Stillwater and Amsterdam, and, and going out and paying money to attend sectional events at these you know, wonderful fields with lighting, and wondering how do these small districts have you know, these great facilities, and, uh, and then learning that, these, you know, that we're paying for these uh, facilities across the state as Bethlehem taxpayers. And we have been for many years. And so again, the, the question comes, well, why, why don't we upgrade our facilities and have others you know, give back to our community. I don't know which uh, school is the oldest in the suburban council, but we'd have to say Bethlehem goes back quite a long ways and is, is much older than many districts. And the facilities um, in, in many schools are you know, not comparable. They're, they're tremendously uh, more modern and upgraded. And I, I'm, I'm not a swimmer, but I, I certainly um, know about the, the, uh, the rich history of the swim program here at Bethlehem, and I think that's just a perfect example of you know, these, these facilities we have. Way back when, when we had a pool, we were probably the only school that had a pool, and we had a great swim program. And now if you look at our swimming facilities compared to others you know, that we compete against in other communities and, and uh, go to different activities with, there, there really is a, a deferred uh, maintenance issue here. There, there's talk about um, why don't we have more teachers and less of this, and, and I think the point has to be made that th these are not budget items, the, the, uh, and, and if they are not done at some point in time, these costs could come back into budget for us and put more pressure on our budget. So I, I applaud the board on the, the creative approach to uh, finding assistance in, in, uh, in raising funds for these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that it or oh. <laughs> Just my there's a role would you would the board like us to answer just some of the short questions that sure. we yeah. listed over the past. Uh, I think Mr. Osborne, if, if you could address I know the questions about uh, the longevity of the field, uh, I believe carpet disposal as well as any health issues, I think those were the major issues right off the bat. Pete Osborne is from Palo Osborne, he's a landscape architect, and I imagine he's equivalent to a civil engineer in planning the field. Um, good evening. Um, I've been doing um, both turf and natural grass fields for almost 20 years. Um, so I've, I've gathered a lot of information over those years, and I've done my own research on things as well as what we've done. Addressing um, one of the issues here, let me go back here. Yeah, um, the cost of disposal. Um, originally, I, I, over the years, we've done five replacements in the probably 40 plus fields that we've done. And originally, um, it was landfilled, but the last few turf projects we've done, there's actually a aftermarket use for the old carpet, so there's a recycling of the carpet. It's not going to landfills like it used to. Um, in fact, my own home district had one redone, and they uh, they took the carpet and cut it up in, into certain size rolls, rolled it up, put it on trucks, and shipped it out to be reconditioned. And, and it ends up going back to places like um, batting cages um, and other facilities that have another use for that carpet. Um, and the industry itself really wants to reuse uh, as much as they can. So there's, a, there's an effort in the uh, Synthetic Turf Council and the uh, players in the industry to find ways to recycle all this stuff. Um, and I think you'll see more and more of that as time goes on. Um, with the, uh, so the cost of disposal, uh, you probably won't be on the table by the time you replace your carpet. It isn't now on, on a lot of them. 
As far as the uh, cost to replace it and it being aidable or not aidable, um, all five of the ones we've done were aided um, under a capital project. That's how you would do it. You would have a capital project that would have certain architectural things done and you would just build that into the uh, program and, and the cost is aided by the state. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's usually, that's how they've all been done to date, and that's the only way I would recommend doing it because that, that you get to have it paid for whatever your aid ratio is at the state level, they would pay for that. And that's how they've all been done, that we've done, and that anybody I know has been done. Um, what were the other issues? Oh, yeah. Um, let me start off by saying the first turf I ever was involved with was my partner came to me in 1993 and said, uh, this district is looking at whether to do a re recondition and re rebuild their natural grass field or possibly putting in an artificial turf. And my first reaction was, who wants that stuff? And my partner said, now let's just go through the motions, do our due diligence and see where it leads us. And at the time, there was not a lot of information out there on safety was a big issue. Um, there was not a lot of information. So I, I did a lot of research and found whatever I could find in the library because really there wasn't much on the internet then. There wasn't much of an internet either. Um, and then I got to the point where I started calling uh, athletic directors, trainers, and coaches at college fields, or colleges, because that's where a lot of them were, and they were receptive to talking to me. So I ended up writing my own synopsis, if you will, of whatever I could find on the health and safety issues. And the conclusion is there's a lot, there, there is information out there, and depending on which side of the fence you want to be on, you can find information to support or refute the opposite claim. The long and the short of it was, it, there's so many variables as to safety on a field because it comes down to the conditioning of the athletes. If you're comparing it with a grass field, is the grass field well kept like maybe a professional field would be or is it, um, What's the um, type of sports, what the positions each players are playing, because uh, certain players take more abuse than other players. So, I mean, there's a, what type of shoe they were using. So there's a lot of variables, and nobody's really looking at drilling down and looking at all those variables or, or having a study that really drills down in and, and, and definitively defines whether one surface is better than the other. So there's a, uh, and we had a book, I think that we showed it to the district at one point, of over 400 different types of studies that we found, both nationally and internationally. And really, if you really look at all the stuff, it's inconclusive because of so many of the variables. And a lot of them will say it, even if they have information that kind of leads you to believe that there's safety issues, they all usually say at the bottom in the conclusion statement that more studies need to be done because of such a small um, portion of data that's available for each study. Um, personally, I, I think we, we, we try to track some of the fields that we've done and go back and talk to trainers and coaches and athletic directors and find out how, how the fields are working for them. And because it gives you a very consistent surface throughout the spring, fall, and summer, uh, unlike grass, which, you know, if it's really dry, is going to be hard. And if it's really rainy and wet, it's going to be a very mud, you know, a big mud bath. So there's a wide range of consistencies in grass fields, and unless you have the resources that maybe a Division I school or a professional 
teams have to really keep a grass field, which is a living uh, organism, really, um, in the proper condition, it's very tough, with the, especially at the school district level, with the resources everybody has today, to keep, a, excuse me, to keep those grass fields is in pristine condition as they should be for athletics. Artificial turfs, and especially the ones today where they have the infill on in there, and they emulate more of natural give of earth of a natural field would be. They, um, they're, they're, they're a lot more consistent, and most of the um, school, uh, actually all of the school districts that we've done have seen an, an actual drop in injuries because of that consistencies. Now, yes, kids still can get injured on any type of field, um, especially in football, and that's the nature of football. But our, 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 our um, research and our, you know, going back and looking at some of these fields over time is that uh, because of the consistency, um, it's a, it seems to be a safer surface. Point of order, Madam Chairman. Right now, if you can allow us for a minute to answer some of the questions that are out there, then uh, as the board's directed, this isn't necessarily a debate. We're just trying to get information back. Oh. As uh, some of the other questions, uh, I think there were some questions in regards to bidding. Uh, we have to be un Fortunately, in New York State, where the Wix law does come into place, uh, the Wix law, uh, unfortunately, garners public entities and school districts, which changes the prices here, as well as we're obligated to use certified professionals to do that. It, it would be much easier if we were just homeowners to be able to go out and do uh, the same type of latitude that we have at homes to go out and seek the best price. However, schools are entities that have to operate under that. Uh, I believe... Another question was on funding uh, over 20 years. Any project that's approved, the funding has to be whatever the entire project is on an average. So it could be 20 years. Some items are 30, some items are five. We don't get the choice of that. However, the whole bonding situation has to be done based on those averages. That's one of the questions out there, why we have to do that. Although. I think the question was, with 20 years with the turf, uh, and say the turf actually, I think they said 10 years, although most turfs have a, a warranty period between 8 and 12, and they go beyond the warranty period, even with the extensive use of a AA school. What happens is, if you had to, say, replace a turf uh, in that 12, 15-year range, what would happen is, yes, you're still paying on a 20-year bond, but you might be paying on a roof that has a 30- or 40-year payout. So that's where the law of averages come in. What was the other? Oh, we did want to make one, one question. A gentleman stated uh, in regards to like the bleachers that that could be done at 100%. We want to make sure that the right information is out there. It might be considered 100% aidable, but that 100% aidable means that it's 100% aidable at the district's 70% reimbursement rate. So we always want to be careful so that people do not get confused by aidability uh, and factors uh, as they may exist, because some people will use that 100% and say, oh, the whole project's 100% funded. Now, if it's a million and it's 100% aidable at 70%, 700,000 is funded, 300,000 is not aidable. So we want to make sure that the community has that. Oh, and just so that people know, the, the pool lights and a majority of the pool, except for the interior finishes, are included in the EPC that's up here. Anything else? I think that's all. Away okay. to you. I feel like a game show host, was so thank you. Was the interior surfaces of the pool, too, was that going to go into the regular budget? What was that? On the interior part of the pool, was that going to try and go into the regular budget? Some of the interior finishes, I think, are in the amount of about 200000 Oh, so it's about 400000 It would be very difficult for it to go to the budget, but some pieces may be able to be looked at by operation and maintenance. Okay. Okay. Okay, I think we wanted to get through people who haven't talked yet. That's okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah, I just, I just, uh, my name is Pete DeVries and I'm a resident. I've got two kids in, the, in town. I just wanted to, uh, again, thank the board for all the efforts they put, put in on, this has been over a year process. Um, I did want to say that uh, on the safety front, both of my kids uh, play soccer with the Bethlehem Soccer Club. I've coached and uh, been a parent in that club for 20 years. And they play on this exact turf for, have played for this entire time. Uh, they've grown from four years old all the way up till going to college and they're still playing on the same surface in college. Virtually every college has this material. Uh, they haven't had any ill effects of the, of the turf. And in fact, uh, I, I've read some studies that the NCAA tracked soccer, soccer uh, games uh, in 2003, 2004, found no concussions were caused by contact with the turf. They were caused by player-to-player -player contact. Um, again, if it's so dangerous, wouldn't Child and Protective Services be taking the kids out of my house? Car tires is what this turf is made out of. They wear down as we drive down the road. We're breathing them as we drive down the road. The dust from the tires comes out of the wheel wells of your car when you wash your car. If you wash it in a driveway, it's washing down into your yard. Snow plow comes down the road, the dust is getting pushed into your yard. It's in your yard, it's everywhere. I haven't heard a concern about car tire dust everywhere. I think we got a tremendous opportunity with this with the turf idea uh, to improve our town facilities. Um, we don't do a whole lot of it. It's a rare opportunity that we have a chance to do this. 20% of New York State high schools already have the turf field. Currently, we must be paying our $2 million a year to be putting turf and somebody else enjoying it. I hope that our voters will step up and pick up the $2.70 per thousand and put the turf in in Bethlehem so that we can enjoy it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, come on up. I must admit, I wouldn't give advice on how to build fields, but biomedical research is what I do. It's what I've been doing for longer than I'd like to think about now. Um, the studies are actually pretty clear. I agree 20 years ago, there were no data. There are several excellent reviews over tens and hundreds of thousands of games I'll send it to the board after this meeting. Um, there's exactly one peer-reviewed study that suggests that one specific type of surface might not be more dangerous. It doesn't say it's less dangerous. It might not be more dangerous. It was funded by FieldTurf, a manufacturer of artificial fields. Some of you might know that I, I write an occasional blog for the Times Union on Bethlehem, and I put a piece up about this proposal. The first comment I got was from a researcher funded by FieldTurf, it kind of reminds me of those researchers funded by Philip Morris, who said, it's fine, tobacco is perfectly safe. Look, the fact that we've done these studies funded by the tobacco manufacturers, don't worry about that at all. Every other independent study, every single one, says that there's an increased risk of ACL, of concussion, etc. Like I said, I'll send you the data. The last point I wanted to make was, given the rapidity of that response from an artificial turf manufacturer, just in my little blog on Times Union, I would appreciate the transparency extending to a statement from the board that none of you have any links to or benefit from any artificial, any artificial turf manufacturer. I'm sure that's the case, but I think it would benefit you just to make that statement. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Bill Davis. I'm a parent in the Bethlehem schools. I have three kids. Um, I would like to uh, address my comment on my surprise uh, how many of uh, the facilities have been neglected over the years, especially the athletic fields and our uh, pools. From listening to everyone tonight, I think there's general agreement that the community wants transparency. We want to keep our teachers and we want good or great facilities. I vote for great facilities. Uh, my comment is um, 
capital bonding is the method to address capital improvements. That's especially the major ones, and that's what we're hearing, a lot of what we're hearing tonight. Um, and for our regular budget process, we always try to squeeze in as many teacher FTEs as possible to help explain why all this maintenance is put off. In our personal lives, we always put off maintenance. Um, it's clear to me, in my, my, uh, since living in Delmar in 2010, the, teals, the fields are terrible. I'm a runner. I can't even run in the fields. And it's like a week after it rains. I, I can't even run out there. It's, uh, and I'm a track athlete. I, I don't run on the track because there, there's holes. There's potholes on the track. And I, I, I don't think it's safe to run on it. Um, so if you spend millions of dollars on track and field upgrades, we should make the full investment for an eight-lane track. This is not a luxury these days. I went to Fonda Fultonville. 1989 was the year we put an eight-lane full-scale track. Um, and I, I do ask the board to remain vigilant to make sure the taxpayers get the best value in our regular budget process. And I ask the public, who are the voters for this, these propositions, to not discount this bond because of past budget choices to neglect maintenance in our fields and to not discount this because of uh, connecting it to uh, teacher layoffs or uh, school closures. Uh, th those are really, they should be considered separate issues than these capital improvements that have clearly been neglected for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, Jeff Brown again. I just had a question perhaps for the architects or uh, for anybody about the, um, the community value of, um, let's say, uh, a synthetic turf field. I know that there are many turf fields that have been voted down around the, uh, around the country, and I do know also that communities that do have synthetic turf fields ban an astonishing amount of things to be used on or around those fields, such as sports drinks, lawn chairs, food, metal or rectangular cleats, dogs, bare feet, chewing gum, and seeds. And I do know that uh, there are some communities that recommend that you wash yourself and your clothes after you've had access to these fields. So it may be a question for the uh, architect or for anybody else. Exactly how available will this facility be to the community? What kind of limits will be placed on the use of this field or the track in order to preserve the investment if such an investment is made? Um, and I think that was just based on my question. I'll try to start and I'll ask either Dan or Pete or uh, Ed to jump in. With, with a community field, what happens, I think, Jeff, you bring up a good point. I think the board's intention throughout all of this discussion is to make this as readily available to the community as well as to the school, school district. One of the uh, questions that the board had throughout is a draft schedule because they wanted to also know uh, what would the like the team used to be, because would it all be just one field? As we've tried to go away, right now that's, a, that's called the football field. If this was successful, it would be a multi-purpose uh, field, which would be a schedule that we've already put forward to the board using just this year's uh, athletic schedule for only the fall. But every single varsity and every single, single JV contest would be conducted on that field. In addition, at least one of every modified sport or freshman sport would have the opportunity as well. Uh, so that's the sample. If the field's not being used for competition, because it would really be a main competition field, then it would be able to be opened up for potential practice as well, depending on the weather conditions. Uh, one of the things that you, you have to be very careful on the field is the unsupervised time. Uh, from what I understand from history, when the track was put in, somebody actually put a snowblower on the brand new track so that they could use the track. We have to prevent those type of investment failures. I mean, that, that's one of the things. But on any field, whether it's a turf field or a um, synthetic field, you don't want metal on those fields. It's a potential hazard no matter what. So we have to minimize that. Um, Sports drinks, I've, I've not seen where sports drinks are minimized just because coming as a principal from uh, a school that had both, that was not one of our, our concerns. But what we did is maybe we put a turnstile entrance on that field so that, you know, dirt bikes, uh, ATVs could not enter in, but public could. Uh, so those are some of the uses. I'm trying to think of any of the other, uh, oh, washing. Well, whether you play on a
turf field or dirt field, I would hope every one of our athletes would wash because that's a recommendation from the Phys Ed Council. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the whole point is, is that in, in that situation, each would pretty much similarly have that. I'd leave that to Pete, but I know he mentioned at a former board meeting that the issues of what they use to fill, uh, used to fill with versus now how they fill and the chemical makeup of that was on one of our board meetings. So I, I'd leave that to him. But I, I'd also have a question I'd follow up with that is I believe they also make the crumb rubber, but they also make clean fill too, correct? Yeah, the crumb rubber is, the crumb rubber is, is uh, specially graded and washed, so you, know, you don't really have the dust um, in it. And, um, the, and then the other component in the fill is the sand, and it's a specially graded sand because you don't want angular sand so it locks it up, and you don't want, you know, a whole gradation of sand particles, so they end up with a compacted situation. It's very tightly controlled sizes of sand to keep the drainage open. Uh, that's the whole whole component of this field. It's a totally drain through system, and 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 you want to maintain that. As far as chemicals, um, yeah, there are chemicals in the in the artificial turf. Uh, the same as the seat covers on these chairs or the rugs in the school and everything, they're a lot of the same chemicals. Um, are they biologically available? N no, not really, because they're all bound up in the plastics. I guess I'm too close to the other one. Um, so there's been some studies, there's been some studies done on um, are these chemicals in these turf fields uh, biologically available? and New Jersey and the state of New York and a couple other places have, have um, deemed that they are not. Um, actually, the New York State Health Department has a fact sheet on these types of fields and they looked at all the different uh, criteria from injuries to chemicals to all sorts of things. And it's available on the website. So you can Google that and look at what this, your own state of New York has done. So. Well, as far as like seeds and stuff like that, I mean, you're, you're, a grass field is, you know, a living thing and things decompose and whatever on there. This, they're not going to decompose like that on an artificial turf. So you really don't want the seeds and things like that there. But there, are, there is a grooming machine to, you know, one, maybe once a month uh, groom the field and it would pick up a lot of that stuff. So it's not that you can't do that. It's, you, you might not want to, but it, stuff happens. As far as drinks and things, they, you know, the next rain washes it right through the system. May I ask uh, one more question? Sure. Yes. Uh, you said that the chemicals are different and they change it. If this project goes ahead, would you release to the town all the chemicals involved in the manufacturing and maintenance of the turf? Yeah, I think um, we're actually required on a lot of products that go into schools and things to have um, MSDS sheets that indicate all the chemicals that would be in the makeup of things. Prior to signing the contract? Um, that, that, that would be up to the district and, and it also depends on the particular vendor that, that would be chosen for that that turf product, because you can't just, you have to have um, competitive bids, so um, which type of turf would be chosen, you, you're not really sure until till the very end, really. Well, my question now is, you are a contractor. No, and you, no. He is a professional I'm, service vendor for the district. I'm a okay. licensed professional. I'm and licensed. you are not going to participate of the bid? No. Uh, no. No. They represent us to get the best value for the community. No, I mean, I, I'm a licensed professional. We're all licensed professional. And really, the bottom line of our license is that we're mandated to protect health and safe, health, safety, and welfare of the general public. If I thought so for you a, should read the fact sheet I handed to them. Pardon? I can, I can hand one to you. Here. Yeah, OK. Thank you. OK. Mm -hmm. Yep. Judy? 
I'm just going to mention, I was involved with the group that wrote the fact sheet um, for the health department, and um, a couple, of, we really did try to stay very objective. We just tried to make information available to decision makers, um, and the health department not being one of those decision makers. Um, we did mention uh, heat stress as something that people really ought to think about, especially with the crumb rubber in field turf fields. Um, DEC conducted a pretty exhaustive um, environmental sampling uh, uh, a regimen down in down near the city and Long Island at uh, some different fields and again some of the um, the heat during the sun, um, during the sunshine the the in, crumb rubber infill turf was a lot hotter than the grass fields nearby um, and uh, um, there were some there were some you know certainly mentions of some of the impact injuries because the speed and force of play on on synthetic turf is just that much greater. Um, you know, so you can have a lot more of these, just like Ewan mentioned, um, uh, in impact in related injuries. And I'm trying to remember, um, zinc is something that leaches from this crumb rubber turf and gets into the groundwater. And in some of these areas, they actually had to control it and get speedies permits um, because of the zinc effluent from the crumb rubber field um, from the tires. And with respect to us breathing tire debris and, and dust, yes, we do. Um, EPA just lowered the PM 2.5 standard and actually said roadside air monitoring compliance will be part of the requirement. So they're not ignoring particle exposures from cars and vehicles, um, including degrading tires. So I just had to mention that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Both of those reports, the, DE the DOH fact sheet is online and DEC's um, uh, environmental study is, and we did a health characterization of that, is on DEC's website. Hello, uh, my name is Chuck Class, and uh, it's been uh, 18 months since we first uh, brought this small idea to the board, Jimmy and I and Scott, about the uh, artificial turf. And it's evolved into this great project. And I applaud you guys for taking the time, the due diligence, to present this to the, to the community. Uh, I think it's all worthy. I think it needs to be done. It's an investment in our community. Uh, obviously, it started with me, with the art, art, artificial turf. But it's evolved into this, and we should all be proud of it. Uh, I think it's time to put it to a vote. We could stand here for the next 18 months and debate this all. And we all bring up good, great points. Uh, there's arguments on both sides of the table, but it's time to put it to a vote. That will be the proof of whether this community wants to support this investment or not. Uh, again, thank you for your time. And I look forward to being able to cast my vote. Thank you. Thank you. Walter Gould again. I wish to point out that my major objection is not to the turf. I think that's a minor item, $3 million. I'm really concerned about the $20 million which we're spending on maintenance which should have been done within the budgets. That's my concern, this overriding concern of $3 million. I understand the desires for all of the athletes to have a, an adequate work space so that they don't hurt themselves. And I understand all of the athletic people that are speaking in favor of it. However, I represent a taxpayer who's on a fixed income, and I'm hurting because of all of the increases you've had, and now all of a sudden, from things that I foresee should have been done under normal maintenance, have not been addressed. The pool should be in adequate, safe condition Yet it needs some work, 200000 or $400,000. Hey, something's wrong here. And that's my argument. I'm not arguing against the turf. I want to make sure that every one of you know that this budget, this big bond issue, is really aggravating in light of the fact that we, we spent all that money for a new school, and then we sold Clarksville School. I mean, there's been a few mistakes made. And I think that the... Uh, 
generally speaking, the football field should have had adequate field designed into it when it was built originally. Most of the facilities do have that. I've worked on a few school projects, and I've worked on the soccer fields, and I know what it takes to put a good field in, and I know what it takes to put good drainage in. But done right, it lasts. Maybe this wasn't all done the way it should have been done. Thank you for your time, and I really appreciate the patience of the board, and I appreciate all those people who are here looking at this whole situation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Joanne again. I was going to write a letter to the board about this, but uh, since we're having this tonight, th this is something that really sticks in my craw. Number 51 and number 65, replacing kitchen equipment. As all of you know, I was the president up at Clarksville when it closed, and we had a brand spanking new kitchen put in with all the bells and whistles. And it was beautiful, I must say. It is a beautiful kitchen. Their kitchen equipment is top notch. I don't understand why that kitchen equipment is sitting in that school not being used. If that kitchen equipment can be brought to the places where it needs to be brought, it should be brought out. Now, I never discussed this with Dr. Douglas, but I did discuss it with Dr. Devano at the time, and it was, Joanne, we need to leave it there because we're going to open up the school again. Well, we're not opening up that school for three years at least while the sheriffs are still in there. That kitchen equipment is not up there because of it being a uh, Red Cross center for when we have a Red Cross disaster. The Red Cross comes in and handles what they need to handle. They don't need that kitchen equipment, and it is not the purpose of the Bethlehem Central School District to provide them with brand spanking new kitchen equipment when you're looking at a total of 400, over $465,000 in kitchen equipment that you need to put in as a priority one when it's sitting seven miles away. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, remind the board and and the public here tonight that uh, a couple a couple weeks ago uh, we were at a board meeting and and Charmaine asked the administrators of all the different departments uh, associated with the fields what their recommendation was for that facility. And the athletic director uh, who runs all the PE classes recommended the turf field because 30 minutes after rain stops, you could use it potentially for PE classes. It rains 12 days a month on average here in Albany. Uh, the facilities director, Mr. Nolte, recommended the turf field. And then we went down the line of all the coaches that use that facility and they recommend going with the turf option. These are the people that work in the school with the kids. They know the facility. They know the facility out back, like the back of their hand. And that's what they recommended, that we move ahead with the turf facility. So hopefully the community gets that message that even the people that are running the programs here recommended the turf facility. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hi, it's Tim Nietzsche again. Uh, this will be my last time uh, very quickly. Won't need your sign this time. Uh, so two things. Uh, cost matters, obviously. Uh, we live in a very uncertain time, and cost matters to everyone, in including, including us. Um, just to get a sense of the scale, for the average home in the community, we're talking about a dollar a week. So just to get a sense of the magnitude here. And the second uh, thing is, uh, in one of the presentations that the board had seen, um, they looked at cost of both, uh, lifetime cost of both options, natural grass with drainage improvements, multipurpose synthetic field, uh, both upfront cost and the cost to maintain it when you include the additional usage that we will get on the multi-purpose synthetic field on a per unit basis it's actually about half as expensive on a, as a per unit as it is on the natural grass field so thank you once again appreciate it thank you
Hi, I'm Karen Kissinger. I have two students here in Bethlehem, middle school and high school. I've listened to a lot of the discussions at this meeting and other meetings, and I hear people arguing over individual items, whether it should be on or off the bond. But I think the bigger question is whether or not you support the concept of a bond. I like the concept of a bond because it preserves the biggest portion of our school budget for things like teachers, support staff, and the things that have to stay in a school budget and cannot be bonded. So for that reason, I support the concept of the bond and urge others to consider supporting one or both of the bond items. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Um, I don't know, Dr. Douglas, if you want to answer anything or... I think we're done with question with comments. No. Hmm? Just do okay. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, up here where you can get more information, we will be posting the video from tonight. So, although not everyone can come out, please ask them to go to our website to become informed. Uh, no matter what, as the board deliberates and debates and, and goes forward with any potential resolution. There will be a time period uh, before any potential vote could happen, which would be around the second week of March on this timeline. Uh, the district is going to try to make, as we have, everything available and also put out short, simple fact sheets. Please share them. If anybody has questions, please invite them to come in. Our administrative team, as well as our professional services uh, under our Ashley McGraw, as well as their uh, contractors, will be here at the board's discretion as well as the community's discretion to try to answer those questions and make sure that you have the facts and not just opinions. It's really important that throughout this process, that's what the board's number one objective was, to get factual numbers, to get factual information, and always try to give that to the community or at least have access to that. Our website has this symbol under it, facility improvement propositions. That's where you would be able to find uh, the information that we've gathered over time, as well as the videos. Uh, and you can get there by www.bethlehemschools.org uh, and facility improvements will guide you to that direction. In addition, we have future meetings. Uh, potentially, there is possible adoption of a bond resolution, as well as the legal notice at the January 23rd Board of Education meeting at 7 o'clock, and that will be in the library. We also have the February 6th Board of Education meeting, which is one of the things this board emphasized and, and really stressed that before any potential bond referendum was voted upon, the community would at least have the understanding of where our budgetary picture looked for the 2013-14 school year. That will be the night that we start to present and then it will still be in a state of ebb and flow because we're waiting for the governor's budget next week. But we'll be starting from February 6th and then each of those board of meetings from February 27th to March 6th uh, would be on budget discussions. With the potential uh, capital bond referendum being somewhere right now between March 12th and March 14th pending our legal notice uh, with the papers if a resolution was passed on the 23rd. So that's the best we can do on that. So we hope and invite everyone to come out. Um, is that my last slide, I think? Again, on behalf of the Board of Education, myself, my entire administrative team, and I think every faculty and staff member, we appreciate you coming out and participating for the leadership of this district, as well as for helping the board as they uh, determine one of the paths for the district to consider. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you. And then we need to go into executive session um, for so moved, sir. <laughs> second. second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And it's not interesting to vote on anything. Right, and we're not voting on anything afterwards. Thank you, everybody, for coming out.